Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Uh, some of you have been waiting for a while for us to get started, so thanks for being patient with us. Uh, but uh, now we're ready to go, and I think we're going to probably go, rather than 90 minutes or two hours, we'll probably go maybe an hour and 15 minutes or so, so it doesn't end up being too late back east for uh, Renee and, and uh, uh, Brother Cripps. Uh, and we're going to also require some time to do a, the introduction tonight of this chapter. It deserves its own introduction. So before we get started, let me ask uh, Renee to, if there's anybody watching who doesn't know Sister Renee, Renee, just tell them who you are and what you're doing on YouTube, please. Hey guys, Renee Roland, channel of the same name. I contend for the faith once delivered into the saints, the free gift of eternal life given to us by trust in the finished work of Christ. The gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Christ died for our sins according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day. And when we trust in that, he gives us eternal life because he did all the work. Uh, I also untwist twisted scriptures on my channel. Uh, my, our guest pastor tonight, we're late because of me. We had a guest pastor, ran a little bit late, later than normal. I appreciate them waiting for me. It was very gracious. Um but one of the things he said is that the Bible can be dangerous for an unsaved person. They can twist it. That's where you get these cults. That's where you get all this stuff because the Holy Spirit is not teaching them all truth. Okay, guys, I look forward to this study with you. Line by line, precept by precept tonight. Right, Brother Luke and Jason? All right, God bless. Amen. And uh, I, I will say amen to uh, Renee's uh, description of her channel, uh, she does better than anybody I know, anybody I've ever seen. Uh, untwist the twisted scriptures, as she said. That's a great way of, of pointing it out. The scriptures that the Lordship heretic use against the, the free gift of salvation, uh, she's able to teach you the proper understanding of those verses. So if you or anybody else is having trouble in that area, that's where you need to go. Renee Roland. Uh, now, Brother Cripps, tell them what you're doing on YouTube. Yep. First of all, I will say amen as well to what uh, Renee said. Very, very crucial uh, ministry, and it has been something that has helped strengthen uh, areas where uh, I might have had some things that I wasn't even aware of that might have been twisted uh, just because of all the interpretations that I grew up with, and it's it's been enlightening. Um, I'm Jason Cripps, and I have a uh, part of a channel called True Story Live, which comes on Sunday nights at nine. And uh, we just invite everyone to come to the table and have discussions. And most of the people on the panel are believers, and we have one uh, uh, person that calls himself uh, an atheist. But uh, the more and more I get to know him, the more and more I think that uh, he's he's on the edge of seeing this stuff all clearly. Uh, but basically, he comes up with questions to ask a Christian panel, and we all discuss it. And uh, we, we definitely invite people to come and listen to the show. But for tonight, I love coming uh, to this uh, Bible study on Wednesdays. It's helped me tremendously. Uh, you know, we're, we're here to, to uh, study his word and look at it and have discussions of it here as well. But it helps me in my everyday life. Uh, it's amazing. The more we dive into scripture and the more we look at it line by line, precept by precept, uh, the more beneficial it is to us. Uh, and we hope it's beneficial to you. Thanks a lot, Brother Luke. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, uh, first, let me address the, the moderators in the chat room. Uh, uh, tonight, more so than ever before, uh, I'm going to ask you moderators to try to direct the conversations in the chat room to the subject we're discussing tonight. I know it's often in the chat rooms, people get involved in all kinds of other conversations and normally that's perfectly okay. But the, the, this particular chapter is uh, so important that uh, I'd like everybody to remain focused on it. And moderators, if you do find someone in there that's trying to stir up trouble and change the subject or uh, uh, trolls, uh, please nip that in the bud. Uh, let's so that we can all stay focused on this study tonight. Now, we're beginning Romans chapter 9 tonight. Uh, it, it, we, we, of course, we started uh, working with 
uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 1, and finally we've reached this point. So if you have not seen all the previous studies on the book of Romans, I urge you to go watch it all from the beginning. But now that we're at chapter 9, this is something I've been anticipating for a long, long time. And uh, so uh, this chapter, we, we gave an, the first study we did on the book of Romans, the first night, uh, much of the time was giving you an introduction to the book, uh, laying a foundation. Uh, kind of giving you a lens to, to look through as you study the book. And it may seem strange, but this chapter uh, really needs its own introduction also. So uh, bear with me as I make a few points here, and then we'll get into the verses. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to read. I've done a lot of study preparing for this, uh, teaching this chapter. Uh, a lot of notes I've taken, a lot of preparation. Normally, I kind of fly by the seat of my pants. I, all of us are kind of extemporaneous the way we do these things. But tonight, uh, it's a little bit different uh, because of the importance. So uh, let me read this. What I wrote, it says, The problem with Calvinism begins with their misunderstanding of Romans chapter 9. Because they get this wrong, they are forced to then redefine many words in all the other scriptures that clearly debunk Calvinism and TULIP, such as some of the words that they have to redefine are all, world, whosoever, and many others. You might wonder, why do they have to redefine these words? Is is because they've uh, erred in this foundational problem, Romans chapter 9. So uh, let's look, what is the, the... purpose of this chapter. Uh, Chapters 9 through 11 show Jews' place under Gentile gospel and to provoke Jews to emulation. The Gentile appropriation of salvation and reason for the transition. The transition is Jew to Gentile, uh, national to individual. Judaism to the gospel, which is faith alone in Christ alone. Chapter 9 is not about salvation, but about God's use of Israel and God's sovereign right to choose individuals and nations for his purposes, such as Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to bring the Messiah to the nation of Israel. It is used as the center post of Calvinistic determinism. However, God uses man's free will to determine who will be saved. Matthew 23, 37. Think about this verse. This is, you learn so much from the single verse about free will. O Jerusalem, these are the words of Jesus. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. So we'll get into the verses, but the reason this is important to to get this, a a premise in our mind before we go, we, we, we go on. Calvinists, if you're not familiar with it, they consider themselves to be the intellectuals of Christianity. And they, they basically, Calvinism is a philosophy, an evil philosophy. But a Calvinist takes the Calvinist viewpoint and reads it into chapter 9. If you did not understand Calvinist philosophy and read Romans chapter 9, you might not come to that conclusion of Calvinism. But what you need to understand is what I just said. As you read chapter 9, you need to read it with these thoughts in mind. It's not about personal salvation. It's about God's uh, sovereignty to use individuals and the nation of Israel, God's right to choose them to use for a particular purpose. So you have to keep that premise in your mind as we go forward. Okay? Before I read any of the, the first verse, though, uh, Renee, uh, just give me your feedback on that so far. 
or I couldn't get my thing on a little slow with my mouse sometimes. Uh, this chapter also kills replacement theology. Uh, it, there is no Jew or Gentile, just one new man in Christ in the church, but there's still the nation of Israel. Right here, Paul is saying that the nation of Israel is being dealt with. They're temporarily blinded. We don't hate them. We didn't replace them. The church does not replace the nation of Israel. And people say, well, oh, we're spiritual Israel. Well, in a sense, we are. We're the spiritual children of Abraham by faith. But it doesn't replace the nation. And I get called a Zionist and all these horrible names. And, oh, you support those fake Jews that live in the land of Israel. They're not the real. It's horrific what I get whenever I do anything that tells people, hey, we don't replace Israel. God isn't even done with the nation of Israel, the descendants, uh, physical descendants up by the flesh. Uh, and God knows who they are, whether they're fake or not. That's not our business. God knows that. And there is a literal nation. And that nation was crazy. Shall a nation be born in a day? You know, and in a sense, it really was. It was a miracle that it Israel came back. The nation, the people are going back to the land. So, this chapter is so important to me to understand that a lot of these verses people twist are not to the church at all. They are prophetic and they are to the nation of Israel. Like all the nations come against the nation of Israel. That's not us. We don't replace them. They're not coming against us in the land at the Valley of Har Megiddo. You know, so it's so important to me, besides the Calvinism, which my goodness, Luke, I'm so glad you used that verse because I've used it so many times to show people, but you would not. And also Corazine and Bethsaida, he came there, did all the miracles, but they would not believe. And so their, their uh, judgment shall be worse than Sodom and Gomorrah because they would not. We do have free will. And I've had somebody constantly hounding me lately, telling me we're prideful because we think we chose to believe and I, I just know I'm a filthy sinner and I got to have salvation through God's grace. I'm aware of how much I fail every day and he offers salvation through Jesus. And I just received it. I don't know how that's prideful, but uh, I don't think the Calvinist might say, you know, oh, it's unconditional election. But every single one of them thinks they're one of the elect. Calvinists won't say, hey, I'm not one of the elect. You won't find a Calvinist that says, I'm not one of them. So they secretly have some pride, thinking there's something special in them that God chose to believe. And a lot of the Puritans died in agony, afraid, because they were Calvinistic. And they were like, did, did I persevere to the end? Did I do enough? And again, there's verses to Israel about enduring and it has nothing to do with the church. So this chapter is so important to me and to many. It's a very important chapter, but to me personally, to be able to show people God's uh, prophetic plan. So it's amazing. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. Uh, your initial uh, uh, thoughts on, on my opening statement, Brother Cripps? Yeah, I, I, I'll I'll keep it short, but I just want to say how uh, delighted I am that you're uh, deciding to tackle this in the way that you are. Um, I grew up around these people, uh, Calvinists, and and I was lucky because the the particular church that I grew up in, uh, they weren't uh, they weren't as aggressive. I guess uh, they would share their ideas and share their scriptures with me, but. Um, they were less arrogant in some ways than some of the people I'm seeing nowadays, you know, some 30 odd years later. Uh, and I run into these people and you wouldn't believe the arrogance just comes from them. Um, uh, Renee mentioned pride. It's definitely pride and arrogance. And it, the, the gospel message is so simple. And what happens is men are the ones that twist it, twist it up and make it into something that's not. Um, so again, trying to keep it short, um, uh, I am uh, so glad to be part of this particular study, and I think it's going to be enlightening to everyone. Okay.
trying to paste things into the chat room over there, so some of these things, but I, uh, for some reason, when you try to paste things, it doesn't accept it for some reason. Maybe it's too much at one time. I've tried to do it, but I'll try to paste a little bit more as we go along here. Um, okay. Um, so, let's go. Uh, Romans chapter 9, verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to pause there, but to ask a question and then read verse 3. So, have you ever stopped to wonder what Paul says he has this great sorrow in his heart? Why does Paul have sorrow in his heart? Okay, verse 3. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Of course, my brethren in this case refers to the Jews, not, not Christians. They're brethren in the sense of fellow Jews. Okay, so verse uh, one through three, uh, Renee. Hold on, I'm a little slow again. <laughs> yeah, uh, he has got a burden. Uh, Paul has a burden on his heart for his own uh, brethren by the flesh, uh, the nation of Israel. As he says, you know, he's of the tribe of Benjamin and he has a heart for them. And he uh, himself was blinded thinking he was doing God a favor by persecuting and even standing by and killing and imprisoning those that believed in Jesus. But now that his eyes have been opened, he has a heaviness for them because he understands salvation is in no other. So he says, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not my conscience also bearing witness in the Holy Ghost that I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in his heart. Why? This is talking about a group, the nation of Israel here. He loves these people. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. He's saying that just like Moses said the same thing, hey, we'll take my name out of the book of life, but for Israel's sake, he's saying the same thing. I would accept a curse on me personally if it would save my brethren, the people I love, the nation I love, God's people, uh, Israel. Mm -hmm. Hey, Brother Cripps. Yeah, so I often uh, uh, think about how Paul felt with, with all these things that he has these concerns with and the reason why he keeps pounding on things again and again. Um, so this one's starting out, and I don't remember any other verses or any other chapter starting out quite exactly like this one. So this is this is really bothering him, and he's just making that clear. I say the truth in Christ. I, you know, he's. It, it's how we would talk to someone that we're really trying to uh, convince uh, where our feelings are coming from. So th these are pretty strong words. Um, in my conscience, bearing me witness in the Holy Holy Ghost. So this he's just confirming that he's he's prayed a lot about this. He's talked to the Holy Spirit. He's talked to God about this, and he's presenting his point. Um, and then uh, verse two, he's just describing the nature of his heart, you know, um, heaviness and continual sorrow. Uh, so this is an ongoing thing that he's dealing with when he's looking at his, at, at his uh, Jewish brothers and, and sisters. Um, and then uh, verse three, four, I could wish that myself, this is huge. I mean, taking uh, not responsibility necessarily because he doesn't have to do this, but saying that he wished that he could be cursed, accursed, and separated from Christ for the sake of everyone else. Uh, of course, he knows that that that's not the way it works. So he's going to try in these verses uh, to convince them, and and also for those of us that don't have the same understanding to convince us. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it there. Not much to, not much else to go into so far. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, everybody who's read this in the, uh, previously, it, we've probably all been um, shaken by that statement that Paul says that uh, he would read it. 
For I, I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to flesh. My kinsmen according to flesh is his fellow Jewish people. He says, I wish I was cursed and that my brethren, the Jewish people, were saved, is the point he's making there. Now that is monumental. I wonder how many of us, if any, would ever say, I'm talking about sincerely say and believe, it's heartfelt, that you would give up your own salvation if it would result in other another group of people receiving it. That's how I have always understood those verses, and, and that I believe that's the correct way of saying it. That's the point that that Paul is making there. That should shake us all. Why? Wow, what compassion Paul has. Would any of us be willing to sacrifice our own sacrifice or the salvation for any other people? Maybe if you maybe you have a child or a, you know a, a, a loved one, but a, a group of people, especially a broad group of people that you don't necessarily even know them all, but you'd be willing to do that. That is an amazing statement to make. But the real uh, profound thing that we need to understand is coming up in verse six. So let me. Let me read on uh, verse 4, 5, and 6. My kinsmen according to flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom are cons as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all. God blessed forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. For they not all Israel, which are of Israel. But let me emphasize this first half of verse 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. Okay. I, uh, I think that mo most people are missing a very profound thing. And yet, you know how uh, I have a lot of videos and playlists talking about church history. And I, I like to talk about the beginnings of the church, the mindset. You know, originally it was only Jewish and then Gentiles came in. Originally it was Jew practiced Judaism and believe in Jesus. And then eventually they had to leave Judaism behind. And it's only faith alone in Christ alone. Uh, and understanding the history of this transitional period of the church is important. But here's a historical thing that most people never learn. And that is that uh, oh, well, let me, read, let me read part of this in the Amplified too because it, it drives home something that is um, um, needs to be emphasized. Okay? Uh, verse 4, uh, my, my kids, natural kinsmen, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption of sons, the glory, the special covenants with Abraham, Moses, and David, the giving of the law, the system of temple worship, and the original promises. So he's listing here all the profound things that came from this nation of Israel and these uh, uh, fathers of Judaism, Abraham, Moses, David, and all these profound things he's saying, these are because of Israel, these are because of Judaism. And so to them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to his natural descent, came the Christ. The Christ came from these people. And yet, however, it is not as though God's word has failed, coming to nothing. Why is Paul saying, insinuating, that the gospel has been a failure? I'll tell you why. Only a tiny little fraction of all Israel believed in Jesus. 
as we know eventually the, the jewish uh, part of the church fizzled out to almost nothing almost all believers today are gentiles and so now you have this faith that's a gentile faith it's open to all but it's primarily gentiles no jews and so paul is addressing this problem the problem that was asked why should we be Jews believe in Jesus. None of us do. Look around. Hardly any Jewish people would believe he's the Messiah. So the point is, has the gospel become not effective? If the gospel is really doing its thing, why are all the Jewish people embracing it? After all, they've got the they've got all the, the fathers of the faith, they've got the temple. They even got the, this bloodline, the Messiah. They got all that, and yet hardly any of them are believing. That's why this verse here is so important. Verse 6, not as though the word of God had taken none effect. Have you ever thought why Paul would answer this question? Like, like hey, no, it, it failed. The gospel failed because no Jews, hardly any Jews believe. And he's saying, it's not as though it's been a failure. Okay? So let me get Renee first. Go ahead and give me your thoughts on those verses and, and what I just said. Yeah, I, wa I want to address something right now. One prayer is calling them vipers and all these things. There's a lot of pastors preaching hate against the Jewish people, preaching hate against Israel. And they need to read Romans 9 to understand they're not Satan's people. They are blinded temporarily. They're still God's people. They are just blinded and salvation. It says, so all of Israel be saved. God's got a plan for them and we should pray for them. We're told that. So I'm just saying, let's not get into calling them names and call it, saying they're of Satan and, and all of that. We need to read Romans 9 and see Paul's heart. See Paul's heart for these people. And Paul's heart is motivated by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit in us should motivate us to love them and pray for them as Paul did. So any pastor spewing hate uh, is not of God. And Jay, I'm sorry if you feel I hurt your feelings and you, and uh, you've judged me and there's no coming out of that. And it makes me sad. You can't learn. You said you already went to seminary, you know, everything you, you can't learn from us. So you came here just to check out our behavior. And that makes me sad. Uh, I've taken responsibility. I'm very sorry if your feelings were hurt last time. I'm a passionate person. Uh, I, I, I do apologize for hurting your feelings. So uh, Romans 9 here, it says, uh, Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants? Does it sound like they're, they're Satan's people? No. And the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, they, they have the laws to keep. They kept, you know, in Romans, it says they have the testimony of Jesus and keep the commandments. That means that's the Israel. They were given the commandments to keep. Doesn't mean that, that as people falsely teach that you're saved by works because they keep the commandments like they're saved by keeping the commandments. That's not what it means. It means those people were the Israelites. They kept the commandments, the oracles of God and they had the testimony of Jesus. And that's who they're talking about in the book of Revelation there. Uh, who are the fathers and of whom is concerning the flesh, Christ came. So he was born through them, through that nation as pertaining to the flesh, because we know Jesus pre-existed and then came in the form of flesh, in the form of sinful flesh, but had no sin, who is overall, God bless forever, amen. Not as though the word of God has taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. So what he's saying is, we are kind of a spiritual Israel and they're not all Israel, which are of Israel. He's saying some of Israel has not been saved yet. They have not believed neither because they are the seed of Abraham. Are they all children? So he's saying just because they're born in the flesh after the line of Abraham doesn't mean they're his children because those that are of the faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So we're all children of Abraham, Jew or Gentile. Not because they're born in the flesh, in the carnal after Abraham, but because we have believed. And some of them are children of Abraham because some of Israel has believed. And that's that's what that's saying, I believe. 
Okay. Uh, Brother Cripps, could you tell me if, uh, if you, are you getting this same thing and now that I'm bringing this to everybody's attention? In verse 6, when Paul says, not as though the word of God had taken none effect. Uh, it's, I think what Paul is doing here is saying, well, you could, you could say, you could argue that God made a mistake choosing Israel. Did God make a mistake to choose Israel? I mean, after all, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, Jesus, all came from Israel. The, 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 the scriptures all came from Israel. And yet, the Jews don't believe. This many Jews believe out of the nation. Did God make a mistake choosing Israel? I mean, all, they don't even, they, they rejected him. That, that is, I think, what Paul is, is addressing, that, that sentiment. Um, Brother Cripps? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was trying to think of an adequate analogy to put this in modern day terms. And I just couldn't, I, I couldn't grasp it anything that carries the weight of what I feel like Paul is saying here. So just to put it in a nutshell, you have the maker of all things. You have God choosing a group of people to believe in, in him and to reconcile with him. These are the chosen ones, the chosen people. And after he, he brought them out of slavery and into the desert and to the promised land, after all the things that they saw with their own eyes that no other people saw and the the power that god used in saving them again and again and winning battles for them and then as you said brother luke you know jesse and david and and the whole line of people that that fulfilled prophecy so that they could look at the word and see the savior when he came and then so after all that jesus comes in the flesh to do exactly what uh, God said he would do from the time Adam and Eve left the garden. This is this has been a plan that he's had in place this whole time. And then, so he gets there. Jesus is here. He's come to do exactly what he, what he was told by the Father to do. And they don't see it. And not only do they not see it, but they put him on the cross. So your question is, did God make a mistake? Did God make a mistake? No. He didn't make a mistake because it's not over yet. I can tell you what I've learned from my life thus far. Uh, I I heard all the scriptures about you know waiting on on God and being patient and um, be not weary and well doing for in due time you will reap a great reward. I went a long time and I didn't see it. I didn't see a great reward. All I saw was struggle and I saw breakups and my parents getting divorced and. Jim and Tammy Baker, you know, ruining people's lives and uh, ministers falling left and right. I, I saw a, a world in disarray. And recently, after all the things that I've been through, God's, I'm, I'm in a season right now where I'm starting to see all the seeds that had been planted a long time ago start to flourish. You have to understand with, with the Israelites, with God's chosen people, uh, if they think that God's failed, they're jumping the gun because the story's not over yet. You're judging a story that you're seeing three quarters of the way through. We are going to see every promise made in, in his word. We're going to all see it come true, whether we believed in them or not. So when the Bible says, when prophecy says that, that God's not done, the story is not, is not finished, we have to trust in that and believe in that. So my answer to the question uh, did did God make a mistake? Absolutely not. In fact, he it, it, we're falling right into his plan. His plan will take place regardless of what happens and how it looks. Uh, there was a there was a sermon I forget who it was by, but um, it's the idea of talking about uh, the crucifixion and the resurrection, and the the term was it's Friday but Sunday's coming. It's Friday, but Sunday's come, and he kept pounding that again and again. And that's the situation with the Jews. It may seem all is lost. 
but the bottom line here, as far as Paul's concerned, is he's he's feeling the heaviness of all of this that I just described in his heart of seeing that uh, God chose these people and they turned they turned away and not only turned away from God and didn't see the Messiah for who he was, but they crucified him. Now, the, did God did that fit into God's plan? Absolutely, it did. God's going to make everything happen that he promises to happen. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to repeat this over and over again because I need everybody, if, whether you're in the chat room now or watching this five years from now, I need everybody to have this thought in their mind as they go continue on. Because as we continue on, these verses are going to be twisted by Calvinists to make God evil. That's what Calvinism does, it makes God evil. I made a video talking about this study tonight, five minutes long, warning, Calvinism will be destroyed. And why do I hate Calvinism so much? Because Calvinism makes God evil. Man is an innocent puppet. God is the evil one forcing us to sin. So if you don't get this right, when you come to these next few verses that we're going to be going through, you, can, you don't want to put Calvinism in. As I Jesus, reading Calvinism into it. So that's why you need to get this in your mind. Chapter 9 is not about personal salvation but about God's use of Israel and God's sovereign right to choose individuals and nations for his purposes. Now, and the next few verses will illustrate how he does this, okay? Verse 7. Uh, let me see how far I want to go first here. Let's see. Oh. Okay. Okay. Uh, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy, side, shall thy seed be called. Sovereign act of God deciding Isaac would be the one. God has the sovereign right to choose, elect individuals to serve his purpose. He didn't choose Isaac to get saved. He chose Isaac for a purpose, for the seed, the genealogy line. Verse 8, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. God in his sovereignty, decided that he was going to use Sarah. That's election. Not electing Sarah for salvation, not electing, uh, you know, uh, Tom, Dick, and Harry for salvation. But God has a right as God to choose to use particular individuals. This is what we would call election, electing them to serve, to work in a particular purpose in God's plan. And Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebecca also has had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, not based upon what, uh, you know, um, uh, Isaac or uh, 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 Esau did nothing to do with merit on their part, but because of God's uh, sovereign right to choose who he's going to use for this genealogy. But, uh, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. God will decide. And it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. It's a decree by God, but he's not saying the elder will be saved, the younger won't. It's not about personal salvation. Okay, so that gets us through verse 12, and that's why I keep on emphasizing this. I have to keep on emphasizing it 
if you think this chapter is talking about personal salvation, you're going to fall into the Calvinistic trap thinking that God decides who gets saved and who doesn't get saved. And we have no free will, nothing to say about it. Okay? Uh, Renee? Renee? I was trying to let everybody uh, uh, know. Can Jason go first? I was trying yeah. to remind everybody to stick to the topic. I want to clean up in there. Yeah, all right, thanks. Jason? Yeah, sure, no problem. So to me, when I when I read these verses, all he's doing is setting up setting up the situation for how God chose to make all this happen. It, it, it's not deeper than that. Um, I guess if you throw the, the English word for election in there, that's what gets people all, all crazy. It just simply means that that's the way that God decided it was going to happen. I don't, I don't see why anyone should have a, any issue with that and make it any more than it is. It, it, it's, it's just the way God chose for it to happen. Uh, in his uh, understanding of things from beginning to end, this is the way that he planned to do it, and it's nothing more than that. And uh, Brother Luke, I just wanted to be encouraging here. As many times as you have to say it again and again and again, it's worth it so that people can can see that uh, Calvinism is uh, wrong. It's way off base. So that's the purpose. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Hey, Luke, is it, too, is it too soon for me to even mention what I think about the Esau thing? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Okay. Okay. Uh, it'd be hard. It's hard to do it to say it. I'm just. I, I I have I have Old Testament verses we're going to be going to next to, to Okay, uh, good. Let's. To, let, to I'll wait. In context, but in, anything regarding the last thing I said and and uh, Brother Cripps's uh, comment. Anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, because I kind of want to do it all at at, at one time because it won't make sense yeah. that I'm scared to go a little too far. Okay. All right. So now. The next verse, let me see. I got a lot of pages open and it's hard to, for me to uh, maneuver to pull up the right one here. Let me see. Okay. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. Verse 12 says, It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. So this is God exercising his sovereignty, his right as God and ruler, that he has the right and he exercises it. He chooses how he's going to have all this play out to bring the Savior into the world, okay? And so one of the things he decides is the elder will serve the younger. That contradicts the tradition. The, the firstborn is always... Uh, the one, the main one, and the younger serve the, the, the other. So God's flipping it around here. He's making his sovereign decision to do that. Now, now we need to go to Genesis 12, because we're going to be going to the Old Testament to find out what these things are about. And also, uh, uh, because you don't have the context to know, uh, to know uh, what he, Paul is quoting and referencing Old Testament events. Okay, so now let's go to Genesis 12. And uh, this is the purpose of election and or the, the calling of Abraham and his descendants. Verse 12, uh, I mean, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Maybe I should post this. Uh, let me see if I can post it here for everybody. 1 through 3. Uh, this is chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Let me try to get up there. It'd be helpful if everybody could read along with me. Did it let me? No, it didn't let me. Let me put in the chat, in our private chat then. At least Renee and Crypt can see it. Okay, I got that there for you guys. Okay. Thank you, sir. Oh, okay. I clicked on the wrong thing here. All right. Okay, here it is. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, 2, and 3. Now the Lord has said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, 
unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. So let's say first here, he's talking, the subject is a nation. Not talking about salvation, talking about establishing a nation. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So uh, this is the purpose of the election when we see election in the in, in the in this context we understand that elected for what elected for salvation no elected to become a nation elected to have this messiah come from that genealogy so that all families of the earth will be blessed so uh God is sovereign and he chose these specific people for his purpose, but the purpose is not individual salvation, but rather is to establish a nation and to establish genealogy through the Messiah. Also, his choices were not based upon works. We're going back to verse 11. It's not based upon works. Uh, who's better, uh, uh, Isaac or Esau? Nothing to do with that. God just chose one for him, whatever reason he wanted to. He doesn't choose us for some random reason. You get saved, you don't get saved. You get saved, you don't get saved. It's not like pulling a ball out of a bingo thing where a ball pops up and the people get saved. That's Calvinism. This And that's how they twist this portion, this chapter, to make their case. Okay, Renee, what's your thoughts on that? Because the context, what this is talking about here, yeah, yeah. It, it refers back to this, this portion. Yeah. Of reason. And, and I didn't want to get ahead. Because me trying to just, you know, go over those verses would have meant I would have gone too far. What One thing I wanted to say here is God often and almost always uses whoever those of the flesh reject. Esau was the fleshly father's favorite. Remember, he was a hunter. He was a man's man. And he was his father's favorite, whereas Jacob was not. And what I see is God often chooses the lesser, like David. They didn't even consider bringing David in when they were choosing, when he was, uh, the prophet said, uh, God has chosen a king out of this family. Jesse brought all his big, strong sons and left David in the field, didn't even bring him because he was not, because God often looks for something uh, that is going to, people will know that it's God working. It's not of the flesh. It's not of man's will, but it's God working there. It's his plan. <clears throat> so uh, what I see here, and I'm so glad you mentioned it, is because I hate this any, mini miny, mo salvation lottery that, you know, they have come up with because it really gives God a bad name. And I've heard them use every excuse in the world to try to say it doesn't mess up God's character. If he saves anybody, he's still mercy. It's just, it doesn't sit well. So I'm so glad you're making it clear that it's nothing to do with salvation. And uh, when it says, um, which are the children of the flesh, it's not of the will of man, uh, but it was according to the election might stand not of works, but him that call it. So it's God's choice. And I believe he chose Jacob. He always chooses the one that seems to be lesser. And I wanted to mention something here. When he says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Okay, the word hate here in the Hebrew, if you go back, it does not mean that, ooh, I despise him. When J Jesus said, oh, stop it, we're doing something serious. Um, when Jesus told the disciples, if you don't hate your mother and father, you're not worthy to be my disciple, right? What he was saying is you don't hate your, you're supposed to honor and love your parents. That's not what he meant. The word is here is uh, difficult to explain the way they put it because it's almost like God hates him and he's not saved. It doesn't say anything about salvation at all. Uh, hating means that he just hasn't, he hasn't shown him uh, his, I don't want to say portion of favor or his purpose because God, uh, Jesus is saying, if you don't put me before them, so loving and hating here is more like uh, choose, uh, putting your focus and your purpose 
upon Jesus and not your parents, not things of the world. So when he's saying I hated Esau, he's not saying I hated him. He's saying I didn't work with him. I didn't uh, choose him for this. It's like he, he just chose not to use him, but he chose Jacob to use him. And it is for the, so the election might stand that God's choice of uh, the lineage chosen for the lineage for the Messiah to be born. So I, I don't, I don't think God is unrighteous at all by choosing the, the, the one, this other son that's against, as you said, tradition, because the elder always, you know, is above in inheritance and so forth. He's the head after the father. So God chose to go against worldly tradition here. And I think that's all it's saying. It is a promise of the coming Messiah. It is about the lineage, you know, uh, and it, it's not nowhere in scripture does it say Esau is not saved. And, you know, they go, he goes on to be the Edomites later, but, you know, it says elect according to the foreknowledge. So God knew what his plan was. Um, and I believe he does foreknow what our free will choice will be, but always uses those, those things for his purpose, his sovereign purpose. But he doesn't do every little teeny thing and force people to make choices and force his grace upon you to make you believe. I believe he knows what's going to happen. He uses those circumstances for good. Like Joseph's story, he used all that for good. And it was still under his sovereign purpose because he was able to save many people uh, but he didn't choose to have him be sold into slavery or choose to have him put in prison. He used those circumstances. So I think it's kind of the same thing here. It's hard to understand with us being stuck in time space, but I wanted to clarify that it's not that he hates him as in despises him and has rejected him. No, he just hasn't called him. He hasn't put his focus on him. His focus was on Jacob for the purpose, the election, the choosing of the Messiah being born here. Okay, the uh, the idiom of uh, of uh, hate and love. Yeah, uh, hate me, me, meaning just lesser degree of love. That's on my notes to come up. So yeah, we jumped, uh, we jumped ahead a little bit on that, but we'll we'll go over that again a little bit more. But uh, there's something else we need to go over here first. Brother Cripps, did you give your thoughts on the last thing I just said? Uh, take a turn, and then I have some more uh, Genesis to go over. Yeah, and I'll keep it fairly short. Renee did a great job uh, laying it out there. So the only thing I wanted to say that if you look at this as any strategic game that we play in this in this world, uh, chess is a good example, uh, risk, stratego, uh, games that we play where there's some kind of strategy involved. So if you play any game and you already know, you have the forethought to know the person that you're playing and, and what kind of moves they're going to make, you're going to play the game in a certain way so that you win every time. Now, that's a poor example because we're human. We don't have foresight. We don't have all knowledge, but God does. So this is not about salvation at all. He's simply telling the story about how he decided to, to use Abraham, Abram, uh, to bring about his perfect plan. That's all this is. Um, yeah, so uh, like I said, I'll just keep it short. This is just setting up the plan like you would in chess. You would use certain pieces in order to make moves that would bring you the victory. And in God's foreknowledge, he saw that Abraham, who responds? Abraham didn't know who God was before he approached him. God knew that Abraham would respond and he would do what he asked him to do. He knew that in, in his in his foreknowledge, he knew that Abram was the best person for the job. Abram had free choice, though. He had free will. He could have he could have turned God down and not done what he told him to do. But God knew that he would. So he still gave him the choice like we have choice. God still knows what we're going to do, but it doesn't mean we don't have choice. He's not going to force us to do anything any single thing if we if he gives us a choice and we choose not to follow it there will be someone else that comes along that will make the choice that he wanted us to make so abraham was the right person the right piece for the job hey look jack's max here you guys 
Good. <laughs> Hi, brother. Hi, brother Jack Smack. Nice to see you. Uh, okay. So this this point, uh, I've said it several times. I'm going to keep repeating it all the way through chapter nine. That these portion of scriptures is not about personal salvation, uh, the way a Calvinist will tell you. It is about God's sovereign right and exercising his sovereignty and choosing individuals for a purpose, developing the nation of Israel, developing a genealogy for the Messiah to come through, how he chose one individual and then the next one, each generation, he chose this one for the purpose of the genealogy. Now, I'm telling you that, but a Calvinist could say, well, they could tell you that it means something else. So who's right? Well, I'm going to sh show you. I already referenced the last scriptures from Genesis to, to make the point. We're going to go over and over again back to the Old Testament because what Paul is doing is the same thing Jesus did. Many of the things Jesus said, people don't realize it, but Jesus is referencing something in the Old Testament. Maybe some, you have a Bible as a footnote. Maybe there's a letter A next to Jesus' words and you look it up and say, oh, Jesus is referencing something that happened in the Old Testament. Paul is doing this throughout chapter 9. That's why I'm going to show you, don't take Brother Luke's word and just my opinion, this is not about personal salvation, it's about this instead. No, no I'm not asking you to take my word for it. I'm showing you that Paul is quoting and referencing Old Testament events in this, and it should be understood from that perspective. So next, let's look at the horrible verse that people love to use and the, to make God look evil, and it's, it is uh, verse 13. Now here, here I go, oh, don't let this throw you off. The beginning says, as it is written. <laughs> Woo! That should be a clue for any Calvinist. It says, as it is written, okay? So you should have an idea now how to take this by going back and looking at well, it was written. Let's find out where it was written and get the context. That's what we'll do. Okay, uh, we're going to Genesis 25, verse 23. And this is, this is about choosing nations. God chose Israel and rejected Edom. Okay, Genesis 25, verse 23. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Does this sound familiar? The elder shall serve the younger? If you've been paying attention, instead of going off on all kinds of other topics uh, in this discussion tonight, if you've listened, you should recognize this statement here, the elder shall serve the younger. It's talking about the nation's of Israel and Edom. That's what Paul is referencing here. And uh, so let me let me get um, uh, first, Brother Cripps, just give me your feedback on that. When it says, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Yes, there is a, there is a, uh, Renee's point is a valid point also. We'll go to that next. But the, the real context of this is not about degrees of love, love one person more than the other. No, you need to understand that this is talking about the nation of Israel and the nation of Edom, and God uh, choosing Israel rather than Edom. So Genesis 25, verse 23, one more time before you comment on it, Brother uh, Cripps. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Brother Cripps? Yep. So he's just simply laying it out very, very clearly, and we're drawing the parallels to that. So the, the two people born, Jacob and Esau, in the womb, one of them would be uh, the nation of Israel and the other of Edom. Uh, and this is making it just super clear what it is. It has nothing to do with salvation. Again, it's it's God's strategy being talked about. It's his choice to do it this way. Uh, it's nothing more than that. It just, it, it, gosh, it's just so clear to me. I, 
Actually, there's a part of me that doesn't understand how people can get pulled into this doctrine. Uh, it, it certainly is a, just a misinterpretation of Scripture. Um, I like how you started it out, Brother Luke, or actually Paul did, but you're, you're making a point of it saying, as it is written. Anytime someone says, as it's written in the Bible, they're referring to something that came earlier. And here it is. Here are the verses that, that we're talking about. So they're, they're just drawing parallels. And again, I'm going to keep pounding on the same thing. This is God's strategy. It's him telling us what his strategy was. It's not about him being evil and choosing some person to be saved or not saved. Um, Brother Luke, I believe you mentioned it earlier. You said nowhere in the Bible does it say that Esau wasn't saved. It doesn't say that. It's not about salvation. It's about choosing which nation would be stronger than the other. One's going to be stronger. One's going to be weaker. If you're an employer and you own a business and you have two people come apply for the job, again, this is a poor example because it, 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 we're not God. But you own a business, you have two people come and apply for a job, and you look at all their uh, capabilities and you look at their resumes, you're going to make a decision about who the best person is to execute the job that you want done. It's not that either person's bad or good. It's that you're choosing someone that you know is going to do what you need them to do. And again, in God's foreknowledge of how this would all play out, he simply cho chose the best people to have it come about the way he wanted it to come about and have the Messiah born out of that bloodline. He knew all the time from the, from the foundations of the world that this was going to be his plan. And this is him telling us. This is just just Paul uh, reverting back to uh, the Old Testament because the Jews that were listening at that time would have understood this. He's using their own book to show them this idea of the, the way that God set it up and his strategy. It seems super clear to me. <laughs> I don't know, but thanks, yeah. Brother Luke. Okay. Uh, Renee and, and uh, Craig, yeah. uh, in, the, in the private chat here, I put up the Malachite port that we're going to go over next. But go ahead, Renee. More, more thoughts on what? Yeah, I, I, I saw it when I said he later becomes a nation of Edom. I was like, oh, I cannot go too far. So I'm so glad that you said this because I just did not. I, it's hard for me to do sections and then not explain. You know what I mean? I know. You I'm know scared. so much. That you automatically but, want to go on and on because you right. know the story, but right. uh, I've got a, I've got an outline carefully organized to try to systematically prove the point. I'm try I'm trying to not do that so badly, uh, so I'm so glad that you explained it. But one of the things that you said just it says as it is written, it should tell you right there. And one of the things I see, you know, the Bible is all together about salvation because it's building up to the truth of the gospel and who Jesus is, the law of the prophets, it all points to him, right? But not everything in scripture is salvation or being lost. There's historical stuff. There's, you know, people just, they don't read in context. They don't think back to what was happening back then. What is God referring to? His plan is put out through uh revelation dispensing dispensation of revelation and people just don't do that and then you get craziness like calvinism out of this stuff when they don't divide it right you know and uh i said earlier that that pastor said if you're not saved you can you, the bible can be dangerous it can be crazy you can make up all kinds of stuff so i'm so glad that you're trying you're explaining that jacob yeah he was a person uh, and I was trying to not go to the nation issue because I knew we hadn't gotten to that. But I'm so glad that uh, you're mentioning this because it's clearly about the fulfillment of the nation of Israel and God's plan for the nation of Israel. I mean, we know that when he changed Jacob's name, it's all God's plan. And so, uh, it, and again, Esau, it doesn't say anything about Esau's not saved. I, I go crazy when people go in the Old Testament and go, Solomon wasn't saved. Saul wasn't. They, I mean, they just make this stuff up based on their opinion of who's good and bad. And so I love, I mean, just, that was the greatest wisdom as it is written. Should have given it away right there. So important. And 
I personally do not think Calvin was, I don't know. I, I wouldn't follow him for any kind of theological advice at all. So I don't understand this huge cult that's come out of it. Um, and you get crazy theology like Calvin's theology um, when when you don't read things like as it's written, as you so wisely told him to do. I mean, it's about the nation, God's plan for the nation. It's all about Jesus's birth, man. It's all pointing to him. Yeah. Paul is giving us all a history lesson about what happened before with all of these ancestors were leading up to the Messiah, how these all fit together. He's given us a history lesson. Amen. That, that's why we need to go. Uh, see, I'm going to say it again. You don't take my word for it. This is not a conclusion or something that I came up with some theory. I've got theories on a lot of things in the Bible, but this one is not my opinion. These are going back to the Old Testament verses that Paul is referring to. Now, if you want to know what he's talking about, you got to go back to what he was talking about. So next we're going to go to Malachi. And Malachi 1, verses uh, 1 through 4, okay? I put those in the private chat space for you, Renee and um, Chris. Okay, the, now this is, this is and Malachi comes after Genesis. So this is, you want to know what happened when God was talking about what will happen to uh, Edom and Israel and uh, Esau and and, uh, and uh, Jacob and how this is going to play out. Well, Malachi tells you how it all played out, just the way God said it would. He said, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? saith the Lord, yet I love Jacob, and I hated Esau. Does that sound familiar? You think Paul is saying that, you know, God loved Jacob and hated Esau because Paul invented this idea? He's quoting this. And so this is what he's quoting. And I hated Esau and, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Verse 4, whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. So this is not about the individuals of Jacob and Esau, how he loved this particular person in the womb and hated the other one. God does not hate anybody in the womb. And this is God's knowing how history is going to play out and telling us in advance and then Malachi recording how it actually happened. Okay. So, uh, Brother Cripps? Yes, absolutely. It, it, it simply is, again, <laughs> I'm going to sound like a broken record. It's, again, it's just simply laying out the strategy. It's, it's, not, it's not talking about choosing one person to be saved, uh, Jacob, and choosing Esau to, uh, to not be saved. Um, and again, it's these people that are misinterpreting uh, scriptures, and they're using their own pride and arrogance to come to conclusions that aren't backed up by scripture. This is why we're refuting this, because so many people are getting dragged into this stuff, and uh, they're uh, forcing people to just have all these questions that are unnecessary. God's plan for salvation is not complicated. And if it starts to get complicated and there, and confusion enters in, uh, we should know immediately that it's not from the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sister Renee, your, your thoughts on uh, Malachi scriptures? No, I had a. I can't. I can't discuss it right now. I'll tell you in a minute. Okay. Uh, now we're going to go to what uh, Renee referenced earlier: the idiom of uh, loving and hating. Um, even though I think everybody should understand now, this Paul and Genesis and Malachi, these portions of scripture are not really talking about God's love or hatred for individual people. 
It's talking about the nations of Edom and Israel. That should be clear to everybody now. But the idea of God hating and loving, uh, uh, there's, it is important to understand this because there's as a verse from Jesus, Luke 14, 26, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Uh, and there, there's a, uh, um, in the language of the time, there, the idiom or the way of speaking was uh, not that uh, he, Jesus hated one person or he says we have to hate our, our uh, the ones we love. We have to hate them because he's more, impor more important. No, we don't have to hate them. But by contrast, the love I have for my wife and son and my friends and family and all the people I love, by contrast, our love for the creator that created all of them. They wouldn't be here for me to love if God didn't create them. My love for God, my creator and my savior, by comparison, should the contrast should be like comparing love and hate. That's, that's the idiom or the, the way of communicating, the communication that is being used. Uh, okay, uh, Brother uh, Cripps, Renee talked about that. If Renee, if you want to talk about the Malachi scriptures at any point, let me know. But Cripps, what do you say about this love-hate idea? Um, I, I, all I can say is that I agree that it's that it, that it's not what they make it out to be. I I think that Renee explained it uh, super well in saying that it was. Uh, oh, you know what it is? It's favor. It's it's degrees of favor. God favored Jacob more than more than Esau. Uh, so he fa he he favored uh, the Israelite people more than the Edomites. Um, uh, that's what it comes down to. And again, it's it, it's back to uh, God seeing everything from from the beginning and the end, everything. He sees everything take place. And it's simply the strategy that he chose to bring about the birth of the Savior. Um, he's not deciding who goes to heaven and who goes to hell here. This is This is the way that a plan was set up in order to have the Messiah born in a certain line and to follow his pattern uh uh throughout history okay yeah on uh, the malachi thing uh when i met remember when i said oh who later became the nation of edom i did want to go ahead uh i also wanted to say now i know god is his elect according to the foreknowledge of god the father and i believe when he chooses he has foreknowledge he knows who will do what? He knows everything that could possibly happen, all the chances, all the possibilities, and it goes ahead. Just like I said, Judas was chosen as one of the disciples, so the scriptures will be fulfilled for Jesus to be betrayed. So um, I believe he knew what people would do. I believe there is free will, but God in his sovereignty uses those little choices and does it for his big picture. I believe the foreknowledge of God the Father knew about the nation of Edom. They would not be faithful to him. They were idolaters. Um, and and I, I can't, you know, a lot of people get mad at me when I say that. But I just believe because God's in eternity and we're in time space, there is a measure of God knowing what people will do before we even do it. And he takes that information and allows it to uh, fulfill a greater purpose. And it's all about Jesus being born to save the world. And it, it, God set apart a holy nation. He's not going to have the Messiah come through a nation that's worshiping devils and sacrificing their children. So I I just think that, uh, you know, the verses about what Edom did uh, um, is kind of, you know, it's hard to say, but that's my personal belief when it says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, that's exactly what it means. He foreknew certain things about the nations. And again, the focus is all about Jesus's birth so that he could come and fulfill his destiny of dying, being a ransom for the world, reconciling the world to himself. Mm -hmm. So it, it's all about him. 
Yeah. And and not about again individ this makes me crazy, Luke. I'm so glad you keep saying this is not about and Jason, you too. It's not about individual salvation. It's not. It's bigger than that. You know, it's about the potential of the world being saved through Christ. Amen. Okay. Uh sister, do you have psychotic powers? <laughs> Yeah, I've got ESPN. Psychotic powers, <laughs> I said, not psychic. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I was say, yeah, I've got ESPN. Okay. The, the next point, the last point you just <laughs> about foreknowledge in my notes is the next point we're talking about. So you just like answered the next thing I was going to bring oh. up already. It was awesome. <laughs> so this is the point here. I put it in the in the private chat here. It says also God's foreknowledge of Esau's character is a factor in all of it. Yeah, I believe so too. Yeah. I believe and, and so let's look at Hebrews 12, 16 and 17. It says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for what morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. So, see, I see him. He's a man of the world. He's yeah. a man of the world, and that's why the world loved him. Yeah. Now, they, we, they did it. I we, think so. We didn't know, care for things of the Spirit. We know Paul wrote Romans. We've been talking about that all along. I think Paul wrote Hebrews too. And so Paul here in Hebrews is referencing Esau again. And I agree. You, you put this together and say, you know, he's talking about Esau and God hated Esau. Well, why? Because of God's foreknowledge, he knew the character that would play out with Esau. I agree. I have been attacked for saying that. I did a video on this, Luke. I was attacked for saying that that Esau didn't care for things of the spirit. Uh, Jacob did. Even though he did all those terrible things, he was so dishonest. Jacob means something like deceptor, liar, or something like that. I forgot. It has something to do in Hebrew with you know, being a shyster, but he, it didn't matter because he did care of things of the spirit. He knew that a blessing was more important. He knew that spiritual things, I mean, you can see that. And so, and again, God always chooses the one the world doesn't choose, you know? Uh, so, uh, and Esau, it was clear Esau was his fleshly father's favorite. He was a hunter. He made him meat. He did. He, he was a man's man. And then also we know he married into uh, women that weren't of their people outside, pagan women. So I agree with you, Luke. I, I really do believe it does have some to do with Esau's character. And Esau's personal character has something to do with how the nation came out later. Because when you marry into unbelieving pagan people, their stuff gets involved and they start just like Solomon married the strange wives and built high places to their demon gods. Well, when you marry into these things and you're not obedient to God about these things to keep everything pure, uh, don't mix uh, animal and uh, plant fabrics. That's a picture of these things, not mixing them. So his personal character had to do with the nation's character being built later. I believe that bringing in these strange gods, he's marrying into uh, unbelievers and so forth. I just think all of this had something to do with, uh, you know, God choosing Israel, the, the nation of Israel. And I, I, we can't fully understand it, but the scripture does give us enough that it is God's foreknowledge and he'll use who he wants to use for his purposes. He sees the end from the beginning. Paul says, we see through the glass darkly, but God doesn't. He sees everything clearly. He, he sees it like a book. He can turn any page he wants. And I'm glad you said, I agree. I believe Hebrews is written by Paul because of the plethora of, of understanding of the Old Testament scriptures, how he lines everything up. And it's a great book for um, the, the foreshadows becoming the real image, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I love that. Okay. Uh, we're because of the, the time constraints uh, being late back East where you are and we started a little bit late with, we're going to cut this short uh, Brother Cripps, I want to give you a chance to comment on the last point, though, that I posted here. 
about the foreknowledge and, and the verses in Hebrews, and then we'll start uh, summing it all up. Yes, sir. I'm all set. So here, here's the beautiful thing about knowing the story of when Esau gave up his birthright. And I'm sure everyone's familiar with it. So he, he came back and he was hungry and uh, he gave up his birthright for a bowl of porridge, you know, for, for, for a bowl of soup, basically. Uh, so that shows how much his birthright meant to him. Now, we know that this is important to God. God, it's important. The, the birthright is important. So in God's foreknowledge, just as Brother Luke was saying, in the notes, God's foreknowledge of Esau's character, and here it is laid out in Hebrews 12. It, it, lest there be any fornicator, profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. So God knew that this was going to happen. He knew what choices Esau would make over the course of his life, and he also knew what kind of um, intermingling of different beliefs and, and such would come in as well. And that did not facilitate his plan. When he looked at Jacob, uh, Renee mentioned some of the stuff, the being a deceiver. I think Jacob means deceiver. I think that's correct. Uh, either way, he was deceptive. Guess what? Jacob wasn't perfect either, but he knew what a birthright meant. He knew how important the blessing was. So he deceived in order to get the blessing from his blind father. He dressed up like uh, Esau and put on his... Uh, hairy uh, um, coverings and stuff and uh, and made himself stink like the field and tried to fool his uh, father and to give him the birthright, the blessing rather, sorry. Um, so through deception, Jacob got all that from Esau. But if with all the deception Jacob could have cooked up, if Esau cared about the birthright, he never could have stolen it from him. He gave it up willingly for a little bits of meat. So that shows where his, his heart was. On physical things that, that um, fix things in the moment, it fixes it right now. Where a spiritual thing, you may have to wait to see the result of that. Jacob was willing to wait. He waited for his wife for 14 years. Think about that. How long did he wait for his blessing? He married a, a, another woman that he didn't love in order to get the one that he did love. He was willing to go to the mat uh, to, to, to have what he decided was important. And uh, for him, the blessing was important. The birthright is important. So he uh, did what he needed to do to get it. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. So we better sum up our thoughts and... Uh... I think it's very important for everybody to recognize that uh, in this chapter so far, I hope we've learned and understand that Paul is quoting or referencing events and people that happened in the Old Testament in giving a history lesson. And I went to verses in Genesis and in Malachi showing the exact quotes where Paul was getting you these exact words so you can get the context and find the real meaning of what Paul's talking about. Calvinists can't do that because they take their philosophy of evil Calvinism and read it into the scriptures. That's eisegesis, putting your own viewpoint into the scriptures instead of just reading and saying, well, what's Paul talking about? Oh, that's back in Genesis. Okay, now I understand what he's talking about. So, uh, next time, a lot of these verses Paul's talking about, we're going to have to go back to the Old Testament to Exodus, uh, to, uh, yeah, Exodus to see what he's talking about. So we'll continue there. So let me ask uh, each of you to take a minute to uh, uh, summarize your thoughts on the talk tonight, and, and, and then we'll say goodnight to everybody. Renee? I'm, I'm just glad that you took the time to define what this chapter is about uh, and it's got some other aspects again i wanted to come against replacement theology that heresy with this chapter and you've got a better one coming against calvinism and election and 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 their tulip nonsense so uh it seems to me everybody here has the same understanding 
None of that. God picked people to be saved. None of us. And then we understood in a way and we're able to verbalize it. And every one of us on the panel agreed. And some of the people in the chat room too, they fully understood it. You know what they were being chosen for and the bigger purpose, you know? So it just shows you when iron sharpens iron, when you have the Holy spirit, of course we can make errors. Sometimes it takes time for God to show us things in scripture, but when you have the Holy Spirit and you don't know something and somebody else has the Holy Spirit and then they show you something, bam, it bears witness to the truth. It bears witness to the truth. When you're discussing scripture and there's revelation, maybe you didn't know or something, somebody uh, saw it another way. If it's true, there's something that does bear witness. I don't know about you guys, but I feel it. Like, I don't trust my heart. I'm not saying my heart and my feelings. I'm saying that when you look at scripture, somebody reveals something to you, it rings true to you. Then you check it in scripture and you know it and your eyes are opened. And that's how you grow. You know, and that's why we need fellowship. It's important. You know, but again, the Holy Spirit must be in us for this to happen. And I that's what I love about fellowshipping and learning uh, together. All right. Thank you, sister. Brother Cripps, kind of sum up your thoughts, please. Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, amen to what Renee said. Absolutely. Um, so I, I, I also would agree that the three of us and a lot of people in the chat room understand without any problem what this is, that it's not a salvation thing. It's simply the strategy that God chose to set up everything so that the Messiah could be born and come and do what he was uh, meant to do. And of course, um, we know also uh, the big, big thing to remember that the story isn't finished. There are still our prophecies in scripture that have yet to be fulfilled. So let's, let's not jump to conclusions and think that God ever made a mistake. He didn't make a mistake. The story is yet, has yet to unfold completely. And uh, the, the Jewish people can uh, take um, comfort in that. Uh, but they won't because right now they're in, a, uh, in general, in general, right now they're in a, a state of disbelief. But God's plan will bring them uh, to repentance and bring them to a full knowledge that the Messiah had already come. And they will be greatly grieved and uh, they will make some of the best, um, uh, the, the best uh, fishermen, the fishers of men that will happen during that period of time. It will be amazing. All right, uh, and uh, good night to the chat room. Good night to the panel. Thank you for letting me be a part of this. It was awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Brother Cripps. Uh, well, I'm happy to get the report that the, the chat room is unanimously in agreement that this is the right way to understand these scriptures. But that what that illustrates to me is that we do not have any Calvinists in the chat room. Because if there was a Calvinist in the chat room, they'd be arguing that this is the wrong way to understand it. So that's why I wanted to point out that, no, this is not just something that we read and we think, well, this is the way to understand it. No, we went back to find what Paul was quoting and find out exactly what he's actually talking about through the, the Old Testament. So that's why it's, uh, you should be confident this is the right uh, interpretation. Um, now, <laughs> it, 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 the, the, the points that we talked about tonight, like, you know, loving Jacob and hating Esau, okay, that's, that's a big deal to, to understand that on the context of all that. But we're going to come up pretty soon here to the, the Paul's talking about Pharaoh and hardening his heart. And we're going to come up to the part where Paul, Paul talks about the potter and the clay. Oh, that's dangerous territory. That's very dangerous. Those are the portions that we the Calvinists grab a hold of them and, and, and try to make you think that we have an evil God that doesn't let us have free will, but controls every thought, word, and deed and, and decides who gets saved and won't let others get saved and doesn't. They make God evil and every person an innocent puppet of God. But next time, we'll show you what the potter and the clay and the, and the uh, hardening Pharaoh's heart, what that really means. Okay. All right, thank you for uh, being with us tonight in the chat room and the viewing audience and Sister Renee and Brother Cripps. 
so much, so uh, helpful having you join me in these studies. And uh, so join us next uh, Wednesday, and we'll pick up where we left off with the next verse. And uh, by the way, I don't have anybody scheduled for Friday for my interview. So if there is uh, someone who's a regular member of the congregation, if you're actively involved in this congregation, uh, you know, and you've been actively involved for a while, you're someone I'd like to interview. I've interviewed six, 15 or 16 of the, the people, Brother Cripps, Sister Renee, and 14 others. And so um, I need someone to interview Friday. So uh, if I don't get someone to step forward, then I won't have a program this Friday. Either way. Let me I'll know. ask my viewers too. I'll let my viewers know too. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sister Renee, anything else before we say goodnight? No, I just want to say I'm so happy to be here and I'm so grateful you waited for me. I'm so sorry about being late. <laughs> okay. That's all right. And uh, oh, when you sent me that message earlier today, uh, if you don't run off, I can talk to you about that issue uh, when we're done here. Okay. Yeah. All right. So thank you everybody for participating. And bless you all in the name of our great Savior, God, Jesus.